Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us here for the 2020 MFA graduation reading here at San Diego State University. My name is Stephen Paul Martin, in case some of you don't know me. I'm the co-director of the program as well as a fiction professor in the program. And over the past few years, I've had the pleasure and the privilege of working with some very gifted writers. Um, they've been inspiring to me. They've made great progress. Uh, and what we're here today to celebrate is not just that they've earned enough credits to graduate, but that they've made significant progress in confronting the supremely difficult task of mastering a literary form. Of course, this isn't the way we'd like to be doing this celebration. In the past, we've done it in places like the Scripps Cottage and the Love Library. This year, because of the pandemic, we've had to do it uh, online. And, um, you know, I don't, we don't, we'd rather be here in, for real rather than talking to each other through a series of technological representations. But we're not going to let the limits of the medium deter us from the fact that the struggle to master an art form and the level of success these writers have reached is something well worth tremendous respect. And that's what we're showing these writers tonight. Um, before we get going any further, there are all sorts of people I need to thank in, in helping make what we're doing tonight a reality. Uh, first of all, let me start with Megan Marshall, who's a very valuable member of our department and our MFA program. Uh, she runs the Living Writer Series and the Associated Living Writers class. And that gives our MFAs and undergraduates, for that matter, uh, um, an invaluable chance to meet with uh, writers in the midst of their careers, practicing their craft and sharing it with our students. Um, I should also thank uh, the department chair, Philip Serrato. It's his first year being the chair, and he's had to confront this catastrophe, uh, the pandemic. And through all of that, he's managed to keep the department together. And uh, tremendous thanks to Philip for doing that. Uh, of course, he couldn't have done it without two excellent administrators, Kim Navarro and Katie Waltman. And we all work with them every day. We know how friendly and efficient they are. And thanks to them as well for all that they've done. Um, this year, we've been very fortunate to have some excellent visiting writers in our program. Um, in fiction, April Wilder, Matt de la Pena, and in poetry, Blas Falconer. And Blas will be joining us full time in September 2020. Um, and as for this evening, several people here that I should uh, mention have helped out tremendously. First of all, our MFA assistant, Grace Lee, who has provided us the tech with the technological expertise to make this event happen. Uh, secondly, uh, our MFA administrator, Mary Garcia. Uh, here in, in the MFA program, we know that Mary is the backbone of the program. Without Mary, we'd be lost. And Mary does, manages a very complex task with courtesy, grace, and friendliness. And Mary, uh, I know I'm speaking for everyone here when I thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything you do for us. And then last but not least, Sandra Alcoser, co-director of the MFA program, uh, distinguished poet in her own right, and perhaps most importantly, the founder of this program, Back in 1989, Sandra ran the bureaucratic gauntlet that was necessary to establish this program. And it's because of Sandra that we're all here today. So, uh, without further preamble, let me now introduce Sandra, and Sandra will introduce Betsy Luttrell, the first reader for the night. Sandra, it's all yours. Thank you, Stephen Paul. We all thank you for agreeing to be persuaded to co-direct the program with me and for making this evening possible. In addition to Mary and Megan, Katie, Kim, and Grace, I'd like to express gratitude for our MFA professors, Matt de la Pena, Blas Falconer, Corinne Goria, Harold Jaffe, and April Wilder, as well as the other faculty members of our department and all the families of our graduates whose support has made this evening possible. It's been a delight to have Betsy Luttrell as a member of the MFA community. In her full length, This Woman is Haunted and Dragon in My Purse 
her chapbook of mother poems. She crafts the story of a contemporary woman of a certain age who frets over her hair, her age, her weight in the midst of a demanding work and family life. Bessie has absolutely amazed me during her three years here. No matter what challenge or opportunity comes her way, teaching fiction and poetry, composition, doing an interview with Ellen Dory Watson for Poetry International, attending Poetry Week in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, or tending to the needs and companionship of her four sons and husband, she manages to complete each task with grace and miraculously turn it in early. She's an exemplar. Her poems have appeared in Literary Mama, Little Patuxent Review, and Broad River Review, as well as Swimming with Elephants. Please welcome Betsy Littrell. Hi, thank you, Sandra, for such a wonderful introduction, and thank you for being my mentor, especially this past year. You've really helped to push me in the right direction as I've worked to finish my manuscript. Thank you to all the professors I've had over my time here getting my MFA. Um, Blas to you especially. I was lucky enough to have Ilya for a year. Um, Hal, um, SPM, Professor Thomas, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. And now to my reading. The first one I'm going to read is part of a series. It's the first one. This one's called Morning Tea. When I woke up, my hair seemed a shade darker, perhaps to match my eyes. I remember how I threw up after eating an apple and cheese pregnant with my second son. Why didn't I update the album with the new photographs? I tossed the drooping white roses, tinged with brown and cloudy water, but I didn't have it in me to make the bed. I boiled water from my tea bag, wishing it was wine, contemplated my ghostly heart, locked myself in the bathroom, and cried into my tea. I wondered if the tea would still soothe me with the salty tears. I tasted it, but I didn't know. I didn't know. Unbending. Her fingers, long and lean, a piano player's. She finds her hand strumming dark notes, adagio. This is who I am. The notes become wild, ferocious, without giving her body warning, vivacissimo. That is who I am. She smells blue in the air. Fingers relax, unbending. for some reason. I told people I was born in a gas station, the one where pump number three is always broken. My eyes are the color of the Wrigley Spearmint Gum package found in aisle number two and also by the cash register. I like being 39, but I don't know if I want to be 40. Maybe I'll drink a bottle of wine and meringue instead. I remember eating popsicles in my flower jumper. You, you wanted red a green, a green so green, sour like limes, was my favorite. Those days, I made mud pies while watching Robin wash her car after a downpour. I wove a crown of daisies, dirty after rolling down the hill. I think I'll braid another crown before I go to see if pump number three works today. My money is on no, and I hear the fire truck siren scream. This is part of a sequence, um, just a small part, from Moonless Mexico. And when he slapped her, choked her, she screamed, but not loud enough. She clawed back, but not strong enough. She was succumbing, breath by breath by unbreathed breath. A woman from the adjoining room pounded. It's Claire from next door, are you okay? She opened the door, reaching the knob from the floor because she couldn't stand. Fear keeps her silent, her jaw still sore. Bus ride. The man at the bus stop startled me. It was late at night, and I was carrying a bag of plums and lemons. Hello, he said in a voice, gritty, sandy. And I didn't know if he was speaking to the towering oak tree, the concrete bench, the woolly stars, or me. But I decided to say hello back, nodding my head, almost recognizing his face, as one imprinted deep in the folds of my brain, and I almost made it through a full day without thinking of his possum-tailed hair, wooden eyes, and copper hands. I almost forgot that I wasn't a whole woman. And the brown paper sack ripped, yellow and purple fruit, beckoning me to chase them.
Santa Barbara. She fell in love with a town she couldn't live in. Narrow streets, ocean on one side, mountains on the other. A job teasing her to come. The scent of jasmine and tranquility. But she couldn't move there. It understood her as she drank its wine and tongued its rich chocolate truffles, watching people who weren't her neighbors returning to their postcard homes. This town stole her soul. She traveled alone, but not alone, so she couldn't stay. Face unwrinkled, but eyes of history, hot rain dropped as her chest rose and fell, rose and fell, uncold. Memorizing the view, she would visit again in the twilight moments of sleep. And she ate apples instead of raspberries that tasted like drinking champagne with nothing to celebrate. Swallow. I didn't know love looked like diamonds branded on my back by the cold metal balcony of a fire escape, or that it smelled like vomit and Bud Light, or that it sounded like the word no, two letters invisible in the winter sky. Maybe love is lines on liquor bottles that don't stop me from drinking. I curl my hand around a bottle of Merlot and swallow while a priest sprays holy water in another city. He sips communion, light shining through stained glass windows. Paralyzed. After he left, she lost the use of her feet, her legs, as if her broken heart spread down to her limbs. So she carried her dead weight around, crawling. She wore the belted pink dress the one which made his head turn and pushed her dark hair back so it wouldn't fall in her eyes. Creeping through the field of starving grass between the farmhouses, she dragged herself until she could see his porch under the gray sky. A love unreturned is still a love after all. She waited, willing him to notice her figure on the part of his land that he neglected. She could move no longer and rain began to fall as the grass kept browning and burning, despite the shower quenching its thirst. Trailer Park After Dark. Trailer Park After Dark is not the bar on Fifth Avenue of the same name, but the bipolar mood of a hormonal teenage girl. At 15, I pounded my fists and legs on the ground until the tears started to flow. That was the year I first took a drink. The first time was with Kim, who bribed a man to buy his ice house and Zima at a convenience store. She drove us to the woods where we laughed hysterically and talked about the boys we liked. We pissed all over the pine cones, dirt, and weeds. Somehow, we made it back to the trailer she lived in. I was thirsty. I mean, sand in my throat thirsty. I chugged half a bottle of cranberry juice and immediately threw up all over the long t-shirt I changed into to sleep. Well, I stumbled over the sink to finish vomiting. It was Kim's shirt, and I felt bad for the dark red stain I left on it. She told me it was a good thing I threw up, that I'd feel better in the morning because of it. I met my parents in church the next morning, hungover, but holding it together. God judged me while I sang, cranberry vomit still on my breath. Sunset. The scent of blown out birthday candles swoons over the city. As I walk through the honeyed streets alone in an oversized sweater, I become lost in your life, how you use tomorrow as an excuse, how you age differently than me, how you must be replanted every spring, and how I die to the ground at the end of every season. You may bloom longer, but I come back to life, sniffing the air as if it was made of oranges and lemons. Sometimes I drown in your frozen sea, and sometimes I see a sonnet written in your blue irises. I turn down my alley, legs calm enough to lead me home. Orange shouldn't fade into indigo, but it does. Memory by scent. Sitting under a pine tree in the grass, my son plays with a plastic sphere, trying to move a tiny steel ball through a maze his tongue out as he concentrates. A daughter pushes her mother in a wheelchair next to the park, and they both smile at us, the same smile from the same face, one with deeper wrinkles and wiser eyes. 
I wonder if the mother is from the memory care center across the street and if a twilight walk is their evening routine. Their smiles tell me the story of why the nursing home was built next to a place filled with the cracks of baseball bats and children's shrieks when they are caught playing tag. I start to count my son's eyelashes and I name all five freckles on the right side of his face. Without warning, the lone pine smells like an entire forest. Crosswalk. Hector, I overheard him tell the paramedics while I propped him up in the middle of 6th Avenue, his lip and head bloody, surrounded by people dropping their kids at school. Do you remember what happened, they asked him. Yes. He told them he was in the street, holding up his stop sign, wearing his orange safety vest, when the teenagers hit him with their car. This was a man I brought chocolate chip cookies to once or twice a year and said thank you or have a nice day after he helped my sons and I through the intersection. This man with his kind smile, missing a few teeth, weathered skin, eyes shaped like peaches. I knew him just enough to call him my favorite crossing guard, but I never thought to ask his name. Backwash. He walked slowly in the middle of painted lines on a four lane road, palms facing down, fingers fanned, dirty blonde hair days away from being dreads, scraggly beard a shade darker, open flannel shirt, bird chest that looked finely plucked, near, near a yellow drive through taco shop with le red lettering advertising their quesadillas and burritos. And he was probably the lead singer in a ska band or maybe a surfer. The air smelled like industrial glue or paint as light fell out of the sky. And I wonder if he could taste my salted bitterness and spice as I continued driving to soccer practice, seatbelt tightly buckled. The power of the dragon. I found a dragon in my purse, wrinkled. I wasn't sure if it was stuck at the bottom of my black and white bag for weeks or months. Sharp teeth, strong wings, scales all down its back, erasure marks inside the legs, horns, and tail. And I imagine my son trying to perfect each detail. I can feel his nine-year-old arms wrap around me as I study this art, and I clutched his drawing to my chest as I somersaulted across the wooden floor. Don't send me flowers. He surprised me with 17 red roses, my first flowers, and all I could think about was the cider beer on his breath. I kissed him drunk on his spit, and I hung the thorny stems upside down on the wall, draped over thumbtacks, scarlet with crinkled brown edges. Weighing myself on his mother's bathroom scale, I was pleased when the needle settled on 95. I starved myself for him. The next time I was 20, the white roses matching the uniform he wore the day he was commissioned in the Navy, chest bare of medals, just a black name tag and a golden anchor on his hat. Tightly curled blossoms opened and evaced by the window, petals falling before I could preserve them. A decade later, my dad died and I was pregnant with sadness and baby number three. The lilies, cocky with their star-shaped petals and yellow-tinged centers wildly exposed, scratched my throat. And all I could think about was how I went from sitting on daddy's lap and his beat-up beige lazy boy to sitting in the funeral home, unable to cry. If I close my eyes, I can still smell mahogany mixed with gladiolas and the picture of the plaque on his grave. March 19, 2003. Seven pound dark haired baby nursing for my breast, half drinking, half dreaming. Well, I wonder if his dad will ever hold him. Orange and red raindrops fall from the sky as I sit, not blinking, in my brown chair. My husband presses a red button with his thumb from the back seat of his jet, releases a missile that kills an enemy or a child. The distance from the cloud to the ground, too great to know it's ablaze. Is that fireball heading for his plane? I try to breathe, but the air won't leave my lungs. The two of us, new mother, sleepy baby, bonded to this brown chair, watching the world burn. I think this is my last one for you. Yep, butterfly in the window. Every day I hold my breath. In the windowsill, a stained glass butterfly catching light. 
made by my son in a second grade classroom. It looks different every time I wash dishes. Sometimes the red is garnet, other times pink. The yellow spreads on the white wall, and late in the day it shrinks. Like washing wool in hot water, I wither a little each August. He grows up to my nose, and I blink, and he's a whole head above me. At the light of the day, he takes flight, undeclared major, unexplored town. Still, I see freckles on his face, a stray hair out of place, and eyes reflecting the light of a butterfly. Thank you very much. Thanks, Betsy. Really good to hear your work. Our next reader will be Tabitha Churik, a writer from the fiction side of our program. And over the past two years, I've greatly enjoyed reading some of Tabitha's short fiction. She works equally well in fantasy, horror, and science fiction. Um, and I think her most impressive work, though, is, is the novel that she's completed in just nine months in the Creative Manuscript class. <clears throat> this book is called the Light Underneath, and it focuses on a librarian in a university who is in charge of a special collection in which she finds an ancient text which convinces her that the world is about to be destroyed by a race of beings living at the bottom of the sea. Hard to tell throughout the novel whether this is a real problem or whether it's just uh, and a psychotic obsession that she's struggling with. Um, part of the reason why that ambiguity is so skillfully rendered is that Tabitha writes equally well in the fantasy or hallucinatory mode and in the realist mode. Um, one of the best passages is a uh, psychedelic or maybe visionary projection of the mystical qualities underneath the earth a passage that uh, I think rivals uh, the visionary passage in Black Elk Speaks, which is certainly high praise. Yet some of the most powerful passages are also very careful realist descriptions, which root us very definitely in ordinary time and space, even though a lot of the book is about a, a hallucinatory or visionary extension of time and space. Um, so Tabitha will be reading tonight from the light underneath, and in particular, she'll be reading a passage in which the librarian, having been seriously tormented and driven to the edge of sanity, is staying with a friend, and this friend allows her to uh, enter a computer game in which uh, the horrors that the narrator is trying to escape are replicated in the virtual world of the video game or computer game, rather. So, without further preamble, let me introduce Tabitha Churik, reading from The Light Underneath. Um, hi. Thank you, Professor Stephen Paul Martin, for that introduction. Um, I've worked with a lot of really amazing people and professors throughout this program, and before I begin just a couple pages of reading, I wanted to thank um, a small handful of them who really made an impact on my experience here at this program. Um, obviously, SPM, Stephen Paul Martin. Um, thank you so much for your feedback on not only my manuscript, but also my short stories throughout the entire stay in this program. It's been absolutely invaluable. Um, thank you also, Professor Katie Ferris, um, who's sadly no longer with us, but still made my first year absolutely phenomenal. Professors April Wilder and Dr. Angel Matos as well. Um, thank you guys very much for all the inspiration, motivation, and mentorship you've given me over the past three years. Um, also, huge shout out to Mary Garcia. Um, without you, <laughs> we would be lost in the dark. Um, you touched all of our lives several times, um, not just mine, but um, my cohort as well, uh, and made things very bearable <laughs> um, throughout our stay. So thank you very much. Um, without further ado, I'm going to start reading uh, just a couple pages from my culminating project, um, currently titled, working title, so it goes, um, titled The Light Underneath. <clears throat> I awakened as this avatar of myself, 
where I had left off last time, in a downtown penthouse, my home, where I lived with a number of eccentric characters. I passed the bulletin board where I turned in each day's completed quests, grabbing none of the new items highlighted with levitating golden exclamation marks, and instead descended via the private elevator to the ground floor. It was nighttime, and as I stepped outside the glass automatic doors of the complex, the cool sea breeze jostled nearby palm trees with a rattling tempo. Street lights reflected off the pavement, newly damp from a downpour. But just as in Soulhaven, the clouds had already cleared. Pinpricks of cosmic light burst through the black sheet of evening. There was no moon. The streets themselves were unusually void of cars and late night passers-by. Labyrinthine roadways stretched right and left, crossing other avenues every few hundred feet with not a sign of life from any of them. In the stillness, I could hear the crashing waves and howling winds of the beach a, a few blocks west. I followed these sounds, moving slowly over the damp sidewalks and glittering black tops of unused streets. There was something tranquil about my progression forward, something almost ordained about the lack of man-made sounds amid the man-made buildings. Walking through the city to the beat of nature's waves felt like a reclamation I alone was witness to, and with every step I felt more tied to this strangely different world, as though these sounds were made for the sole purpose of inviting me in. The beach was a long strip of cold sand that stretched along the coast for miles, split occasionally by jetties of massive boulders and refurbished, polished piers. The crash and sputter of waves became louder, clearer, as I emerged between the soaring skyscrapers and stepped from cement to stand, sand, my feet sinking into the dull gold, my pace slowing. That's my cap. Beyond the sand and the waves, the black sea met the black sky in an infinite horizon, a perfect mirror, an absence of meaningful distinction between one and the other. Gathered under this moonless night were the people of the city. Thousands of them mingled at the edge, edges of the water, their slacks and legs and skirts wet with the sea and coated in sand. They teemed with motion. <laughs> I guess he doesn't like it. Pushing against one another in all directions, held in by each other and their own bodies, unable to separate like a massive rat king. They stood moving and yet motionless on the shore, small waves lapping at their feet. Mm -hmm. Their faces were terrifyingly ecstatic, the look of someone given a raise, a favorite sport team seizing victory, a loved one arriving home. Together they formed one massive, aimlessly joyous, pulsating mass. I recoiled. The waves, now coming in louder, fiercer, did not retain their allure in sight of this strangely compressed population. All sense of rightful reclamation I'd had on my way there skewed into something that settled badly in my stomach, made it tense and squirm, made me nauseous. There was something wrong, something I needed to remember. I stepped back and collided into a shambling man. I spun around and tripped in the sticky sand and fell. The man, his face alight with unnatural jubilation, continued toward the congregation of people on the shore. Behind him, others arrived from the depths of the city as he had, as I had, their exaltation visible, their eyes watering from how wide they opened. As I fought to stand, there was a unanimous cry of elation from the water's edge. The waves seemed to freeze mid-crash disrupting the invisible barrier between sky and sea in that far abyss-like distance was a massive ball of white light. It creeped upward into the sky. Its reflection creeped downward along the rippling water. Its circumference was 10 times the size of the sun and to behold it completely would have meant going blind. I shielded my gaze, but the mass of people along the shore turned toward it. Their faces shifted, became impossibly more passionate, turned from simple elation into nothing short of ecstasy. Their crying pitch went on like a hymn, and the stragglers from the city limped and fought through the sand to join them. 
As the light of this new sun touched their bodies, they became silhouettes, their arms raised into the sky with a euphoric cry, and together they became one body, one grotesque shadow with 10,000 limbs. Thanks for the great reading, Tabitha. Our next reader for tonight will be another member of our MFA fiction program, Crystal Galvis. Crystal was in my undergraduate techniques in the short story class, and I urged her to apply for her MFA, which she did. Uh, I've been reading her work for the past three years. Crystal works very effectively in uh, horror, fantasy, sci-fi genres. And uh, so I wasn't surprised for her third year uh, to see her generate a novel using elements of all three of those genres. Um, Crystal's novel, which is called Magical, is set on the U.S.-Mexican border. It was inspired to some extent by the atrocities being engineered by our current presidential regime. Uh, the novel involves uh, the struggle of a couple in their late teens, um, one of them, the, the male character Damian, has been hired by the female character Jasmine to smuggle her across the border. Um, Jasmine turns out to be a witch in a very powerful coven, um, and the two characters slowly seem to be falling in love as the novel unfolds. But I'm not going to tell you how that turns out. You're going to have to read the book uh, when it gets published, which I'm assuming will be in the not too distant future. So Crystal, it's all yours. Thank you, Professor Stephen Paul Martin for introducing me. I will be reading a segment from my manuscript that's a clear connection with our current detention center situation as well as human trafficking. But my manuscript is focused on a modern fantasy setting. The bus stopped once more at a station, and Damien told Jasmine that they needed to get off. He had to pick something up from someone before they crossed. Jasmine gripped the back of his shirt as they passed through people to get off the bus, but her grip stayed. There was a large crowd outside, with tents and stores around, people walking in and out. Warm bodies pressed in, bumped into, shoved against. Overwhelming smells of perfumes, over-applied yet expensive cologne, body odor that mixed with the delicious smell of carne asada tacos. It's what she expected in the city of Tijuana. Crowded, lively, loud, and colorful. I need you to wait here. Damien pulled her inside of a clothing stand. Stay here, pretend you're looking around. But stay for five minutes, eight tops. Jasmine watched as he disappeared within the crowd. She huffed and walked around the store, her fingers ghostly touching the fabrics. Mama, why are they throwing food at that man? A little girl called out. Jasmine could hear the rowdy laughter and curses coming from outside. Her mother pulled her daughter roughly away from the window and further into the store. A small group of teenage boys who looked to be younger than Jasmine were throwing vegetables at a man locked in a wooden pillory. No one was trying to stop them. The police weren't around and everyone else stood there, whispering and staring. Hey, I think the magical is gonna cry, one of the boys yelled. Are you gonna cry, Mage Master? His friends laughed cruelly behind him. Leave him alone, niños. Don't you think you should go off running back to your parents? The boy glanced at Jasmine and attempted to fix his hair, but remembered that he had a tomato in one hand and a bag in another. He deserves this. Why? Is un monstruo. Funny, the only monster I see is standing in front of me. But a baby version of it, you're not a man, you're what, 13, 14? She walked around the boy, circling him like he was an artifact in a museum. Not a man, just a boy playing like one. I'm not playing. And how can this mistreatment of the poor man over there be considered a manly act? You think hurting someone that can't fight back makes you a man? No, it makes you a bully and a child, and I believe you need a timeout. Jasmine snapped the bag out of his hands and snatched his ear. The boy cried out painfully at the tugging, but she didn't care. She leaned in and whispered, That pain you feel now is nothing compared to the pain that you afflicted on that man over there. Magicals protect their own, and we don't appreciate bullies. The teen's eyes widened, but before he could say anything else, Jasmine threw him to a circle of buddies. He looked back. Jasmine held a finger to her lips and winked. The teen screamed and ran with his buddies running after him with questions. Jasmine bent down on her knees, sweat trickled down her chest and her back under the sun's intense heat. It was extremely uncomfortable wearing the heavy jacket, but she had to keep up with appearances. She used her left sleeve to wipe off the tomato juice running down the magical sunburnt face. Gracias, niña. She paused in her menstruations. There was bruising on his cheek and a small mixture of blood combined with the tomato. Someone must have thrown a rock earlier. The, the man wasn't only trapped by the pillory, 
There were shackles around his ankles as well. Who would do such a monstrous thing to you? La policia, I forged our paperwork to cross the border. But they found something that I didn't, and this is my punishment. While well, my wife and child are trapped in their own prison, where are they? The magical pointed his finger and Jasmine turned. A long chain linked fence with barred wire loops circled a two-story warehouse. There was a two and a half foot distance between the fence and the warehouse. Small children played outside. Some were laughing as they kicked the soccer ball, trash cans as goals. Women stayed in the shade, breastfeeding their babies. Others were washing and hanging their clothes, and the rest stood in the front of the fence, their fingers curled on the gates with solemn expressions. This is what her abuelitos feared. This isn't what they want the grandchildren to witness or live through. Living in segregation was one thing, but this. Detention centers, or temporary shelters, that's what the humans call them, he said. It's inhumane. No one has gotten out, but more of us have been put in. How do, I, how do I get you out of this thing? No, 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 he whispered fearfully. You'll be thrown in there as well. Por favor, if you can tell my wife, Maria, that I love her and to continue staying strong. She's the one with the purple and orange head wrap. This woman was staring at them with puffy red eyes and clenched the fence like it was her laugh line. I'll tell her. Security cards were, er, were around every corner, carefully keeping an eye on the humans that decided to talk to the magical women. Some were praying along with them, holding fingers and holding their beads. Others were sneakily handing, handing small pieces of food and small water bottles. The closer Jasmine got, the more she saw how skinny some of the women and children were. No wonder humans were sinking food in. It looked like they hadn't eaten a two or three course meals in days. Days. Maria called out, Jasmine called out. The women reached her small hand out to her and Jasmine immediately entwined their, their fingers. She too had a cuff on. Your husband, he wants me to tell you that he loves you and to stay strong. Estoy tratando, Maria weeped, pero estoy muy cansada. Entiendo, but you have to keep fighting. You will get out of here one day. Maria shook her head, tears falling on their, on their entwined hands. We left Guatemala because they wanted to use us as weapons. We are simple witches. I could cast protection spells, but it's not enough with the fighting, the drugs, and all that violence in our neighborhood. Our son was scared to fall asleep at night because of the guns. You thought it would be easier to live in the U.S. We came to seek asylum away from that. And then we heard rumors about having the right paperwork. I should have listened to my gut and told me as that he shouldn't lie. We would just have to trust our instincts, instincts, and I didn't trust mine. You left your home to give your son a chance of happiness and safety. You were scared, and it's okay to feel like that. They're going to kill my husband. Maria's sobs interrupted Jasmine's turmoil, and she looked to see a brave person helping her husband by pouring water down his throat. Then she realized it was Damian kneeling in the dirt, pouring water in a plastic cup from his water bottle. He even wiped the magical's face with a napkin. No, they won't. The police only wanted to display him like this to warn other magicals to not cross the border, and soon they would put him with the, uh, with the other men in their detention center. Jasmine tried to reassure her, but the way Maria tightened her grip and sobbed uncontrollably, it wasn't working. Who knew how many days he'd been put out there as a spectacle? How many days had Maria had to watch him from afar with a child? How many days had they watched people throw rocks and tomatoes at him? Suddenly, someone's hand wrapped around Jess's neck from behind, and the hot stench of alcohol assaulted her senses. Where do you think you're going, mage whore? Do you really think you can leave us? Ethan Jasmine gasped. He was one of the human traffickers that taunted her in that dark room, and now he found her. De hella, Maria cried out, her hands reaching out. Shut up or we'll shoot you in the other whores. Ethan hissed and tilted his body to show his gun in his hand. Now don't try attention this way, or you'll be with the other mage whores over there. I bet your boss will be, will be so pleased with you. You would lose his precious cargo. Again. Shut up, Ethan squeezed her neck painfully and slowly they turned their backs on their prison magicals. Damien was oblivious and still talking to Maria's husband. We're going to walk slowly and get in the car, and we will go back to the ship in your cage. Jasmine's breath hitched. She couldn't go back there, back to the taunts and death raking around. She stomped on his foot and slammed the back of her head against his face. Ethan cursed and his grip, his grip loosened. Then he snatched her hair and tugged her back. His elbow and arm wrapped around her body like a slimy snake. Let her go, Maria cried out and seized his shirt from behind. Other magical women did the same around her, their dirty hands grabbing any part of Ethan's clothes. Get the fuck off! Jasmine thrashed off his grip. The women shouted and cursed at the human. They stretched out his arms, their hands on his face and body. The guards finally took notice and were racing towards them, battens and tasers out. An explosive shir shirling sound blasted past her and dropped Jasmine on and Jasmine dropped onto the ground. The low shrieking sound muffled around her and she tried to stand up. But someone crashed into her and she tumbled down. Feet ran, kicked, and trampled on her. More bodies were falling. She couldn't hear anything over the pumping of her blood in her head. Someone grabbed her hair and pulled her head up. Ethan's mouth was moving, but she didn't care what he was saying. His eyes searched around the chaos, and he lifted his gun. 
A booming sound erupted above them. She elbowed and kicked, and he pulled her over his shoulder, sho shoving the nearest person that tried to push them down. Jasmine slapped and pounded Ethan's back until he threw her onto the floor in a clothing store. You cost a lot more than I thought, Bruja. Boss didn't tell us the truth until you escaped. Who would have thought how important you would be to him? Suddenly, he pulled out his gun in another direction, and someone squeaked behind the counter. A woman popped her head out along with other workers with their hands raised up. No, Jasmine got between him and the workers. You caused the man madness that's happening out there. They're here because you, they work in this store and, you want, and want to be safe from the danger outside. Maybe, maybe if you haven't run away, this wouldn't have happened. How many people are going to die because of Jasmine Morales intervening? Shut up. Wherever you go, death follows. I wonder, did it follow you before or after the massacre of your own coven? Calle de la puta boca. Ja death stalks you, Buruja. Or maybe it's been stalking you. Damian stood behind Ethan with his gun directed at the back of his neck. Put the gun down or I'll blow your brains out. Not in the front of the witnesses, I bet. Get out of here. But the workers stood wide-eyed at him. Go, leave. That got them, got them to scurry out of their hiding spot and out the door. Drop the gun now. You don't know what you're doing, boy. You're making a huge mistake. Ethan slowly placed the gun down. Grab his gun. Ethan stared at her down on his knees and his hands behind his head. Jasmine grabbed the weapon. She clutched it and then pointed at his face. What are you doing, snapped Damian. He's the reason Elaine is dead. But is it? Ethan smirked. I mean, I wasn't with her on the deck. You were. Why didn't you stop her? Why didn't you save her? Jasmine's vision blurred. Her ear was still hurting. Her body had most likely received new bruises from the human stampede, and she hadn't slept in 24 hours. She was not in the mood to be tested. Why didn't you save her, Buruha? Don't do it, Jasmine. Look at me. Look at me. Damian pleaded. But why was he pleading with her? This man was scum. This man tried to rape her friend and sold thousands of magicals to human girls alike. You're not a killer. You don't know me at all. Jasmine didn't even feel her finger press the trigger, but watched as Ethan flinched back with the red blossom on his shoulder. You fucking... Damien smacked the back of his head with his gun and both watched him collapse. Damien's eyes found hers. You didn't kill him. You sound surprised. Jasmine kicked the fallen body. She kicked and kicked and kicked. Okay, okay, okay. I think he got the message. Damien pulled her away. She staggered backwards. Her mind was swirling and her heart pounded loudly and echoing in her ear. Jasmine? She swayed and closed her eyes, unable to fight against the darkness any longer. Jasmine! Funny, that was the third time Damian had actually called her by her name. Thank you, Crystal. Ron Lauterbach came to writing in the middle of his life. Starting with a few articles in San Diego newspapers, continuing with the BA in English literature, he taught high school English and journalism before he retired in 2010. Encouraged by fellow writers, he entered the MFA poetry program at SDSU and bravely signed up for trial by fire by taking the capstone manuscript workshop, which caused him to grow three years in one semester. His work has appeared in the OB Beacon, the San Diego Union Tribune, the Julian News, the Christian Science Monitor, Reader's Digest, and Your Daily Poem. The program has been kind of a magical elixir for Ron, and in his semester, not only has his work deepened and become more adventuresome, but in a gesture of giving back, he's gathered and organized the work of the late poet Steve Cowart, another wonderful member of our faculty and a vital uh, professorial force in the halls of SDSU and Southwestern, whose writing because of Ron is preserved in the special collections of Love Library. We're all deeply grateful to you, Ron. Please welcome him. Thank you, Sandra, for the kind words and for all the support on my MFA. I also want to thank Professors Blas Faulkner, Ilya Kaminsky, Jennifer Manitti Shippey, Megan Marshall, Katie Ferris, Claire Colquitt, Stephen Paul Martin, Harold Jaffe, and the woman who keeps the department organized, Mary Garcia. Thank you, Grace Lee, for producing this video, and here's a shout out to all my classmates who have offered so much helpful advice. My first poem, Bam, appears in the spring 2020 issue of the Chiron Review. Bam. My grandfather was always Bam to me, an odd name, even 60 years ago. But he loved it when I called him that and showed me his skinny old face of suntanned leather 
with a three-day beard and a nearly toothless smile. Dan spent most days working in his shop, wearing a greasy striped canvas apron and a railroad engineer's cap. He beat red-hot steel on his pony-sized anvil, creating a clang heard all over the block, then thrust the hot metal into water that hissed like a steam engine. I watched him work and knew if I came too close, he would lay down his five-pound hammer and put a dirty but gentle hand on my chest or head. When I left Bam's shop, I washed my hands with rough lava soap that stung like a wire brush on my 10-year-old skin. Bounty Hunters. The last part the squirrel can move is its tail. It twists like a pinwheel, its upper body shot away. My ears ring from the shell's explosion and my 10-year-old cheeks tingle with pride. Your hard worker's hand pounds my shoulder as if I am a man. Half a cheese sandwich sits on the sear seat covers in blue gingham bread loaf wrap. The hot rifle barrel rests on the car window frame whose enamel gave up years ago to your honest sweat. It's the same frame you rest your bony arm on as you drive me to get ice cream or fly kites. I imagine myself in a story you will tell sometime around a campfire. When you stop hitting my arm, the squirrel's tail stops. Like one thing has something to do with the other. Puberty. On Friday nights, I usually stayed at John's house. And not knowing how to spell allow, we wrote on the door to our fort, no girls can come in, except Linda and Susan. We competed with each other to see which one of us could put the most wire coat hangers on his newfound erection that suddenly poked out of our Roy Rogers pajamas. Until we tired of it, and went outside to dig up the now decomposed perch we buried to fertilize our watermelon plant. They're building a house next door. Clay tiles on weathered rafters weeks after delivery look weary. Like the plumber's countenance as he carries out a shiny sink, the wrong model, and drops it into his truck bed. His truck needs tires. He might be waiting for a bargain, or it could be news from his oncologist. I see two electricians wander the job, eat their lunch, laugh a lot, and leave. A concrete finishing crew works fast because two guys didn't show up on this hot day and the mud doesn't care. Their boss jabs his finger into the chest of some guy who's holding a big bucket of paint. And I think about Jim Rhodes, the meanest foreman I've ever known, who years ago had me in tears before draping his arms around my shoulders and saying, don't worry, kid, this place may get built in spite of us. Afterthoughts over lunch. My wife wants to know what I think about when I close my eyes as we make love. She asks while we're eating lunch. I take a bite off a fat dill pickle and she asks as I stammer. Sour juice drips down my chin onto sardines we bought on our honeymoon to Portugal last year. I focus on the neon yellow and red tin with the old style key that curls up the lid as you roll it back. I watch the oil ooze inside the coil cover and comment on how rare it is to find containers like this. My wife's raised eyebrow shows her question is unanswered. I imagine silver sardines bumping green noses against a nylon net. Art supplies. An artist friend tells me to set pieces of crayons under the hot sun 
to enjoy chromatic running rifflets. Throughout her atelier, rugs braided from brilliant shades of old clothing soften steps and brighten my day. Statues made from obsolete tools and containers fill shell shelves at the back of her studio, where quotidian toil and purpose become folk art. She asked me to save shards of broken glass and dishes, especially from pieces shown in thrown in anger, claiming art she makes from the result of rage delivers a healing kind of beauty. My friend wants to grow as an artist and is looking for new materials and media. Her plan is to use the best pieces of shattered social fabric to create cultural mosaics. Leon's Oyster Shop, Charleston. The Uber driver tells me to take care because I'm in a bad part of town. But I'm more scared of this freak snowstorm than slipping on icy sidewalks than muggers. Leon feels friendly as I pass through its glowing entry into a mellow den. Tables are full, but I find a pants polished stool at the bar. A server greets me as if I'm the mayor, and the fresh fish fry-up tastes even better than it looks on the menu. The barkeep serves pie that could only happen in South Carolina and asks, what brings me to Leon's on a Sunday night? I tell her I'm flying home in the morning and never miss a restaurant named for my father. It must have been a big-ass bird. It's a mystery what kind of bird knocked power out in eastern San Diego last November. Food thawed in freezers and cell phones died. People had to talk to and look each other in the eye. With no traffic lights, there were car crashes until drivers relearned to take turns. Professional baseball ended and football started. Millions of turkeys began their sad journeys to American dining room tables. There was a solar eclipse and three more people signed up to run for president. After dark, there was looting all over and tags lit up with headlights and flashlights. Boundaries changed and one guy died. Look for a birth spike in August. Thank you. Hey Ron, thanks for a really great reading. Our next reader for tonight is Jamie Aurelio, a member of the fiction side of her MFA program. And I've been reading Jamie's work with a lot of admiration for the past three years. Um, and I'm especially impressed by this new novel called Lifelike, which she's produced in her third year here. Uh, again, like Tabitha and Crystal, she started from scratch in September, and now it's May and she's got a completed novel. So what we're looking at here is a disciplined, highly motivated writer who worked week by week producing chapter after chapter, and here the book is. Inspiration is at least 90% perspiration. Jamie sure, certainly shows that in her work. Um, the work itself focuses on a young adult protagonist named Nydia, who at the last minute is admitted into a prestigious arts academy. Um, and this academy isn't just an ordinary academy. It's magical, mysterious, maybe even slightly menacing in ways that uh, Nitty is trying to discover as the novel unfolds. And brilliantly enough, uh, Nitty's uh, search for what this academy really is uh, parallels her search for what she really is as an artist. And that kind of combination makes reading this a really brilliant process. Uh, Jamie's prose, just like it was in her shorter works, is sparse, direct, elegant, at times magical, filled with brilliant figures of speech. And uh, really pleased with the way Jamie's work has turned out. So, without further preamble, let me introduce Jamie Aurelio, reading from her novel, Lifelike. Jamie, it's all yours. Thank you, Professor Martin, for both the kind introduction and for all the support and guidance you've given me during this whole novel writing process. I'd also like to thank Katie Ferris and Matt De La Pena for their irreplaceable writing tips and for their inspiration in general. I should also thank my husband, Jeff, for not letting me quit or fall apart during this whole journey. 
Just a couple things I should mention before I start. Mrs. Timms is the mentor who helped Nydia get accepted into the program, the um, academy, and Leon, who is mentioned briefly, is a painting student whom she met earlier. Hope you all enjoy a little taste of life like. Mrs. Timms once again brought a book for the subway ride to Arja Academy, but Nydia had other plans for her. She had a hundred questions, but was only able to ask a few during their commute. Mrs. Timms answered her questions patiently, but in a vague way that irked Nydia. Yes, she could use her cell phone, but there was no reception or internet on the island. They didn't get internet because there was some energy on the island that interfered with it. Nydia asked about all the different departments, specifically about the special gifts and abilities each one was given upon their acceptance into the program. That information was included in your packet, young lady, Mrs. Tim scolded her. She obliged Nydia, however, and explained each department to her. She described painters in a similar way that Leon had. They could predict the future through a series of paintings, but only vaguely. Details were fuzzy, and the more one had mastered the art of painting, the more details one could predict about certain outcomes. Nydia thought about the painting club president Leon and how mature and observant he seemed. The gift suited him. Fashion designers were given the ability to make special garments that enhanced the performance of people during certain activities. One student was currently perfecting a garment that made the wearer run faster. Another was working on a sweater that was supposed to lessen the symptoms associated with anxiety. The performing, performing arts department had a very special skill. They could summon people of the past by acting as them. Nydia shuddered as Mrs. Timms described that process. If the spirit approved of the quality of the performance, they could possess the actor for a brief time. Nydia didn't care how brief it was. The prospect sounded horrific. The culinary department was similar to the fashion designers in that they created enhancement products. The difference between the two was that the culinary department specialized in temporary physical changes, baked goods, altered weight, as well as height. The music department was full of empaths who could trigger emotions that listeners had never felt before and couldn't identify. That explained the overwhelming rush of excitement Nydia had felt during the opening ceremony a cappella performance. Nydia listened intently and then asked excitedly about her own department, the sculpting department. What special gift would she be given? Mrs. Timms hesitated. It is different for every piece, she said finally. Now, enough questions. We need to get settled into your room. Nydia hadn't even noticed that they had arrived at Arja Academy. She scrambled to gather her things before following Mrs. Timms, who had already stepped out onto the platform. Mrs. Timms hurried down the stairs and through the street of shops. Nydia had no choice but to follow the rest of the way in silent anticipation. She felt as if she were seeing Arja Academy for the first time. The island had looked so small as they approached, but standing in it now, she realized just how large it was. Vibrant buildings went as far as she could see. Nydia distracted herself from her anxieties by mentally identifying the colors around her. She noticed with immense satisfaction that all the colors of the little shops, larger classroom buildings, and the paved walkways were complementary. There were so many different shades, but without being tacky. This courtyard is said to have the most natural source of raw energy flowing through it. If you pause and take a deep breath, you'll probably feel it, even if you're a new student. She stopped walking and inhaled deeply with her eyes closed. She gestured for Nydia to do the same. Nydia did so hesitantly, but realized she did feel something, almost like an expansive warmth flowing through her body. The feeling went away almost as quickly as it had come. Mrs. Timms laughed at the strange face Nydia must have made. It's a little shocking the first time, but you'll come to crave the feeling the longer you are here. Nydia tried to pay attention while they walked to the dorm rooms. It felt as if they had turned several times, weaving through nondescript buildings. Nydia tried to keep track of landmarks in order to find her way back, but gave up after the fifth or sixth turn down a general walkway, which was lined with trees and exotic-looking gardens. The multicolored, bulb-like flowers looked like they could sprout eyes and walk off. There's your residence hall, Mrs. Tim said, gesturing ahead of them. It was a simple circular building, about five stories tall, painted a sky blue. Each room had a balcony. Many of them had plants and easels set out on them. Mrs. Timms opened one of the double glass doors, gesturing for Nydia to enter ahead of her. The first floor looked like a hotel lobby, with a common area filled with plush chairs and tables. A few students were drawing or painting in the wide room. Nydia couldn't help but peek at one boy's easel. The cityscape he was working on almost looked finished. Nydia had to admit it was impressive. The lights from the buildings looked like a reflection of the stars. The boy had painted the stars into a vague shape of a person soaring through the night sky. Mrs. Timms hurried her along down a short hallway that led to a glass elevator. Nydia had a slight fear of heights and hated glass elevators. The glass doors slid open and the two went in. Mrs. Timms touched a small translucent touchscreen pad and hit five. 
You're on the top floor, Mrs. Timms told her as the door shut and they began to ascend. It has a small stairway leading to the roof. There's a gorgeous garden up there that I bet you'll love to work in. Wow, Nydia said, but she wasn't talking about the garden. She was watching the swirling images that were appearing on the walls of the glass elevator. The swirls looked like colorful streams of water running along the sides, creating splashes of rainbows against the smooth surfaces. You'll like your roommate, Mrs. Timms was saying as they exited the elevator and into a hallway lined with doors. Her name is Lexi. She's a really nice girl. I think she's two years older than you. Nydia nodded, but inwardly grimaced at the prospect of having a roommate. This place was huge. Why couldn't she have her own room? Mrs. Timms stopped at a dark wood door. The plaque read 56. She reached into her pocket and handed Nydia a gold-colored key. I have to get back to my office, she said, turning to go. Rest up. You have a couple of days before classes start. You should look over the packet again and ask Lexi if you have any questions. Thank you, Mrs. Timms, Nydia said, smiling and clutching the key in her hand. For everything. I can't believe I'm actually here. Arja Academy is lucky to have you, Mrs. Timms said. Come to my office after your first day of classes. I want to hear all about them. Nydia promised she would and waved, watching Mrs. Timms until she disappeared around the corner. She took her time, shifting her bag and slipping the key in the lock. Hello, she said when the door opened. She looked around. She was in a small but tidy living room. It was quiet. She breathed a sigh of relief. It looked like her roommate wasn't here. She poked her head into the first room. It was obviously her roommate's. Clothes and other items were strewn around on the bed and desk, but the floor was clean. There was a neat, tiny kitchen, a bathroom with cream-colored walls and pink towels. Nydia's room was at the end of the hall. She looked around the spacious room. There was a simple twin-sized bed with baby blue sheets. There was a walk-in closet that, as promised, had a dozen Arja Academy uniform sets. Nydia pulled one out and, after examining the skirt and blouse, was positive it would fit her perfectly. She put the outfit back and turned, discovering the best part of her new room. A little studio art space took up half the room. It had a shelving unit for all her art supplies, a large easel for, pa for painting, and a wide workbench equipped with the nicest scalpels and clay, the best quality she had ever seen. She moved around the room like a child, looking through all the art supplies with a growing excitement that was getting harder and harder to contain. She was so excited by her fully furnished home that she almost didn't realize what sat in the very center of her room. She stepped closer and realized it was the wooden base of her sculpture, and her sculpture was gone. What? She knelt down to put her hand on the polished wood. Did someone come in and steal it? Or maybe this was the transformation that her sculpture was supposed to undergo? Are you invisible now? Nydia wondered aloud. She stood and put her hand out, trying to feel for the familiar clay and paper, but her hand grasped nothing but air. She stared in confusion for a moment before glancing around the room. Suddenly, she felt a presence. It was like that odd feeling of being watched. She grabbed the closest thing to her, which happened to be a large scalpel from her suitcase. Who's there? Nydia held the tool out in front of her like a sword. She slowly went through her room, turning corners cautiously. Each room was empty. She came back to the base, feeling confused. She rolled around, scalpel extended when she heard a strange sound, almost like a rumbling. Nothing behind her. Her eyes landed on a nearby bookshelf and slowly tilted upward to the top of the shelf. Her gasp caught in her throat, a pair of fiery eyes locked with hers. Nydia fell back on her butt, her scalpel flying out of her hand. Her guest didn't seem affected. He watched her curiously, rounded furry ears twitching when the tool landed with a clatter on the hardwood floor. She should have been screaming, but the creature's non-threatening behavior kept her from doing so. As she tried to get her breathing under control, it hung its head over the edge of the shelf, peering down at her. After tilting its head for a second, it climbed down the side of the shelf. Nydia got a quick glance of glittering feathers and large paws, but before she could fully process that, it was in front of her. This time, Nydia did scream as it stood nose to nose with her, but she stopped immediately when it seemed to recoil in fear at the loud sound. I'm sorry. She didn't know why she was apologizing. It just felt like the right thing to do. But could it even understand her? She guessed the answer was yes, because it made another rumbling sound. This time, it was higher pitched, almost happy. About the size of a mountain lion, it stood on four paws. It was covered in light-colored re reflective feathers that seemed to have rainbow highlights. Its head was sleek and round, with short ears and a soft muzzle. Its eyes were a blend of red and orange. Nydia was completely mesmerized by them. There was a warmth in them that made her feel safe. 
Hi there, she said, reaching her hand out toward it. Where did you come from? It rumbled again before darting away from her. It wandered over to the sculpture base and climbed on top of it, sitting and staring at her, almost smugly. Nydia's head spun. You're... She breathed, air getting caught in her throat. She tried again. You're my... In answer, it pawed at the air. Nydia stood and wandered to it and grabbed its paw, feeling faint when she saw her initials on the bottom of the soft appendage. Oh my god. Nydia dropped the paw before falling to her knees on the hardwood floor. Her knees hit the ground hard, but her whole body felt numb. She stared at the ground, not really seeing the wood patterns her eyes were now trained on. What is this? She muttered, looking at the curious creature that looked at her seemingly with concern before she glanced around her small dorm room, this time really seeing it for the first time. It was so obvious now. The strange location of the school, the fact that Mrs. Timms and the other teachers spoke in riddles, the too nice room that she was given for free. And now this, her sculpture somehow coming alive. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Jamie. Sarah Oslikskin Sahar writes in her bio that she's a Ravenclaw, one of the four Harry Potter houses of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and wizardry, known for their wisdom, cleverness, and wit. She enjoys utilizing both the left and right sides of her brain. After a bachelor's degree in math, Sarah decided to pursue a passion degree and get her MFA in poetry. One for the money, she says, two for the soul. Sarah began writing haiku in second grade and hasn't stopped writing a wide variety of poems since, now utilizing Poetry is a way to process her life and consider the world in new ways. When she announced at the beginning of our manuscript seminars together that she wanted to write a young adult verse novel, I decided we'd be risk takers together since I, who was to be the guide, had um, neither written nor really ever read a young adult verse novel. I'm happy and not at all surprised that she pulled it off. All that remains now is the title, and I begged her for a working title for tonight, and she gave me one. This may be the first time anyone's hearing this reading of Sarah's first novel, I Am My Own Music. Please welcome her. Hello, thank you. As she said, uh, my name is Sarah Sloxen Sahar. Thank you, Sandra, for that introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, normally, my traditional reading style is I just straight, jump straight into a poem, but I would actually like to start today by saying a couple thank yous for a couple of people in the program who have made my life better and <laughs> who are just really awesome and who I don't think I could have done this without. Uh, one is Mary Garcia, uh, official title administrative support assistant, but it should be like grand amazing goddess. Anytime I went to her with a question or any concern, she was always there for me, always able to answer it, and really quick to answer. I told her on multiple occasions, I don't think I could do this without her, and she always said I could, but sounds fake, and luckily I'm graduating, so I don't have to find out. But I am incredibly grateful for her. I want to just start with a thank you to her. Thank you, Mary, for all you do and all you will continue to do. The second person is Blas Falconer. Blas has been absolutely amazing. He's, I guess, a guest, though he just got hired full time and I'm very happy, but I am just in such gratitude to you, Blas. Thank you so much for the way you have pushed me to grow and be a better poet and just, I've grown so much thanks to you. On day one, uh, for context, on day one, Vaz came to our class and said, fail, and told us to just try our hardest and try everything. And as a perfectionist, being given permission to fail and to experiment was just absolutely what I've needed, and I've grown so much because of it. So just thank you so much to those two people. I'm in incredible gratitude. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Vaz. Um, so I'm going to start with my first poem, which is called This Galaxy Inside Us. Uh, one of the big things that happened for me during this program is when I started the program, my father got diagnosed with lung cancer. And then in the end of my first year, actually in line with finals, my father passed away. And so that was a huge part of my 
grad program and it's actually come out a lot of my poetry shout out to my cohort um, and all my workshop people who for hanging in there with me and so this poem is uh, inspired by the first time I actually saw his x-rays in a doctor doctor's office this galaxy inside us my father's body grew the night sky X-rays revealed he had become container to star clusters and asteroid belts. Sunspots claimed the space between neurons and formed galaxies inside his brain, his spine, his lungs, creating constellations. What birthed into his body was more than it was fabricated to handle. And so the stars inside him did what stars do when they have too much matter. Now, I'm left fearing the sun. Today, my doctor called, revealed an abnormality. I think about implosion and fret about galaxies growing faithfully inside me. Um, yeah, so that was my first poem, and now I'm going to transition into my second poem, which is called My Shot. I wrote this one actually as a dare um, my friend in my cohort, one of my dear friends, uh, challenged me to write a sexy Hamilton poem. I was obsessed with Hamilton. I'm still obsessed with Hamilton, but in my first year I was incredibly obsessed, could tell you everything about every cast member, and probably had to do with my dad dying and like displacement, but that's another poem, we'll figure that out later. And so he challenged me to do this and it's just like a testament to how great my cohort is and how I have found some lifelong friends who push me to be a better poet and also push me to have fun and I'm just so grateful for them. My shot. One shot, two shot, dancing connects our bodies. I got a holler just to be heard. Body shots, tequila shots, third shot, we're out the club door. Sometimes I get overexcited. See how I made you swell. Look how those pants fit now. Let them drape my wooden stairwell. I am young and scrappy, hungry. Tonight's the night we got. I'm not throwing away this fucking shot. Um, so yeah, we bet, I, I don't think I said, but we bet coffee for that, and we know how grad students are, like, we need our coffee, um, and I brought it to workshop and workshopped it with Ilya Kaminsky as well as my whole class, and I just shout out to my class because they took it really well. Um, the last thing I'm going to read today is an excerpt from my manuscript. Traditional poetry manuscript is 60 pages that you've probably started working on in your first year and you collect it all to a book, and I was like, uh, so what if I wrote a novel in verse? Can I do that? Is that okay? And I got permission to, and I'm incredibly grateful, and so I spent this year writing a whole novel in verse from scratch, and I've completed the first draft, and I'm in the editing process, and I'm so incredibly grateful for this opportunity. Um, it's a story about a college freshman, it's a bisexual coming out novel, and the excerpt I'm sharing today is the main character has just figured out she's bi, she's come out to one of her friends, and now she's debating if she should come out to another one. Her friend um, that she's talking to right now, she's in the car with him, he's driving her to the airport, and she's just having an internal debate. In the car ride, I debate. Should I tell Jake, or should I keep it to myself? We've become friends, but how well do I know him? I take, take a deep breath in between moments of conversation. Jake, I start, then taper off, using my quietness as a reason not to continue. Assume he can't hear me over the radio. The radio plays. I slide my voice underneath it, match the rhythm of my breath to the downbeat, slowly sink. Remember I had a purpose, a point, and reach. Use the drums, the rhythm to fuel my speech and start, Jake, I realize my voice carries no weight. That at some point I sunk too deep into the music, became a part of the chords, and I try again, Jake, a little bit louder. I've risen to join the guitar, the bass, the parts you notice and pay attention to, but it's still not enough. It's not the vocals. I need a voice. Jake, 
He starts. I'm too loud now, turning screamo in my enthusiasm, but he drives steady, turns down the radio, looks at me as much as he can while he drives. I separate from the music, no longer vocals. I have found my own voice. I use the butterflies in my belly as flocks of courage and say, Jake, I think I'm by. No, I am by. I am my own music. Jake smiles, looks at me long enough to prompt, hey, look back at the road. He turns back and says, hi, bye, I'm Jake. Um, that is the end, and thank you so much for watching this reading. Hey, Sarah. Thanks for a great reading. Uh, our next reader for tonight will be Kurt Krober from the fiction side of the program. Uh, many of you know Kurt was the editor of Fiction International over the past year. Uh, and I've been reading Kurt's work for the past three years and greatly admire uh, his risk-taking, innovative techniques. Um, and especially admire his sense of humor. Kurt's a really funny writer. A good ex example of this is a short story called Bug, where uh, the character takes a new designer drug and uh, the story focuses on all the bizarre effects the drug has on him. Wonderful story. Um, similar to that, but much longer, is the novel that Kurt produced from scratch here in his third year, uh, a novel called Good at Drugs. Um, focused on a character who is attending a house music festival in the high desert. A uh, four-day process, so the novel takes place in four parts. And the narrator, um, first of all, defines what it means to be good at drugs, and then shows that he's both good at drugs and not so good at drugs in many hilarious and brilliantly hallucinatory episodes. Um, Kurt is extremely good at describing altered states and humorous states, and his narrator is relentlessly interesting and amusing to listen to. So, Good at Drugs by Kurt Krober. Kurt's going to treat us to a segment of that right now. Kurt, it's all yours. Thank you to SPM for that amazing introduction. This is an excerpt from towards the end of my manuscript, Good at Drugs. I don't think you really need to know anything for it to make sense. The dance floor is truly a sight to behold. Acids coming on woozy in the way, stomach flipping butterflies. Sights for sore eyes transforming out of the cocoon and into something beautiful. I'm overcome with everything. Sun shining down, filling the warmth of my soul. Gorgeous dancers with white teeth protruding between parted lips. Heads bobbing, shoulders bent, bodies in motion, swirling and jumping and immersing. Let it all go. Stand still and stare up at the clouds, thick and white and hung in the sky. Not the bleak gray of a storm on the horizon, but clear as day, clear-minded and full of opportunity. Float on, high above the grounds, bird's eye view of the brainwash, not minding so much at the prospect. Complacency and mind control, better here than there. We could never leave. These hundred turning to hundreds of thousands, and before I know it, I'm 80. Been spending the last 50 years of my life in direct connection with the souls of others, inside something that mattered, riding high on a high, not high to escape, but to be in, a spirituality and connection, people of the sun. The music spins out, struck into a single beat, isolated, running up speed until it's batting right up against itself, a frenzy and then silence. I'm pulled back to earth, off the cloud and to my feet, eyes pulled down from the sky to the stage. Those around me stop moving and settle into some post-movement stasis that one could, at most, call a sway. Track starts up slow, dripping drums, slathered on the snare with a little bit of an extra rinse to them. On the one beat, a single piano stab. Dun! Three more full measures, done. Indy Darling belts out cleverly patronizing lyrics about wanting a hit, but maybe they don't do hits. A pause in the music before a big grinding electro bass comes blasting out of the speakers. The entire dance floor explodes with energy. Fuck, this is what it's all about. 
fumble with the zipper to unclasp the bag. A middling amount remains. Turn it onto the corner so it all collects and I can eyeball what's left. We'll make it through even though I have to take increasingly larger and larger bumps with each outing just to get where I want to be. After my self-dug K-hole, I'd probably really have to go for broke. Dig in without a particular care for quantity, shoving the whole thing up my nose. Who cares even? Find myself drawn further to the stage. Gravity's pull and I can't help but give in. The sea of people part for me, though not in a straight line. Left at the dude with the photorealistic zebra mask. Climb under two girls on their boyfriends' shoulders, practicing the sacred dance of patty cake. Right at the squirrel, talking with the bush. Give them a nod. Can't stop and say hello. Their pupils swirl around their sockets, teeth clenched and heads reared back laughing. I don't even know if they see me. Close my eyes and hum along to the beat. If not in rhythm because my vocal cords can't move that fast, then at least with a tone that feels in line with the music puncturing the air around us. Put myself in their shoes. I can see the vibrato of their voice, fluctuating waveforms green and yellow for high and low levels. Don't redline. Everything goes black again. Levitating in the void, presences pop up all around me, left and right and front and center, fizzling colors form the shapes I've come to associate with people. Second sight, seeing with my eyes closed, really seeing inside the people on the dance floor, the good they've done, their hearts pumping with compassion, the joy in their ears, and they can see me too. I feel like one blood cell floating downstream. It takes all of us working together to make this body work, but we're doing it. A living, breathing, walking, talking unanimity. What's the point of being alone when together, together can, can feel, feel so, so warm? warm? Fought it long enough. Turn my attention to the DJ. Purist shame the new generation of ravers for giving too much focus on the DJ. They're all facing the same direction they complain. Wah, who cares? Why does anyone care what anyone else does? My whole body tingles and I can barely feel my extremities, brain trying desperately to shoot through the top of my head. I feel like a million bucks and that's thanks to three people. The man playing music, the man who gave me more acid than I clearly knew what to do with, and myself. I guess there are more people involved, like the man who crystallized this batch, an unknown soldier in the war on the war on drugs. I guess Albert Hoffman for discovering it in the first place, Leary and Alpert and Kesey for popularizing. Whoever actually made the song that's currently being played, the Pioneers, Frankie Knuckles, DJ Pierre, the Belleville Three, Giorgio, Kraftwerk, the Beauty Collective, everyone who helped put this thing together, everyone here, all coming together into this great big perfect moment. Life itself. I can sense Aurora's aura before I can actually see her. Purple pushing through. Two people over, three back. No hesitation. I'm pulled in by a purple tractor beam. Aurora is as frozen as I am, as if time has stopped only for us. The rest of the world continues on in fast motion. Sped up dancing looks like a cartoon, or at least a cleverly edited YouTube video. Music drowns out. We stand still as the second. This moment can last forever if we let it. Trap it in a bottle and keep it on a shelf high and out of reach, so we can take it down and sip from it any time we need to remember. It's all gone, ripped back to reality. Music in motion and speed set straight. The back of a purple paisley glitter encrusted suit jacket splits my vision from hers, pushing me back into the crowd of dancers doing what they do best, dancing. I remember why I'm mad before I completely understand it. The tip of Dr. Mongoose's chin turns to me first, gray goatee whiskers implanting some rage-inspired hate mail. Dear Dr. Mongoose, I hate you with all my heart and soul. Eat shit and die a slow and painful death. Sincerely, he turns to me, shit-eating smirk riding up one ear like it's his God-given right to do me wrong. The crowd closes between us. Sit down. Right here in the middle of everything. This must be what it feels like when a tornado comes through town and the only option is to hide under the table. A whirlwind above and I'm huddled into a ball, hoping it all doesn't come crashing down. Close my eyes and wish with all my might for Dr. Mongoose to have never existed. My only option is to use his own ideas against him. Imagine him right out of here. He pops like a thought balloon, separating into a thousand pieces and spreading across the globe. A fine mist of never has been erasing its memory as he goes. No longer a recollection of interaction, just another face amongst the thousands. No effect on me but that I let it. And I refuse to let it. Self-doubt sneaks in, as it's known to do. How can I just imagine imagining without context? 
This isn't my idea. It's somebody else's. Hmm. Fuck this. Eyes open, step up, get to my feet, charge right over and put myself right up in his face. Big tough guy, barrel chested bravado, say something trite and hacky like, what's your fucking deal? Real high school fight energy. I'd be down to throw a punch, but not here. Maybe at the steering wheel on my way home. Mongoose squares up, stops dancing, sets his shoulders back and locks his eyes in combination and code with mine. The faux concern on his face reads, whatever could you possibly mean? But his body language is a novel entitled, Come at me, bro. It's a self-help book with the subtitle, A Quick and Dirty Way to Realizing Your King of Your Own Mountain. His typo is not mine. Sold really well through Instagram ads, but never really made the big push to Barnes & Noble or B. Dalton's. The sect who ate it up were also the ones who fell hook, line, and sinker for Bitcoin. Yes? He asks, like I'm the biggest bother in the universe. At odds, through time and space, a real throb in his side. But I don't have much of an answer. What does this guy really do to me? Edge me out on the girl that isn't even mine? Remind me of the self-value I already carry with me every day? Show me what I mean to other people? Fuck. Where is she? Nowhere in sight as if she was never there in the first place. I want to pull back, to run away, to pretend like none of this ever happened and I'm not making a fool out of myself. But it's too late. The circle around us widens, murmurs from those close enough to see what's happening, that I'm some kind of an asshole. An army of same faces backs him, and I'm alone. So very alone. Like that one guy who was on the creek once, and he didn't have a way to make his raft go. A point of no return, backed all the way to the edge of the cliff. The only way out is through. Take the leap. I tell him exactly what's on my mind in the most precise and cutting way I know how. You've got seriously bad vibes. Thank you, Kurt. Rin Corbet writes that he's the husband to Erica, father to Leif and Aaron. Rin mucks stables at age 13, pumped gas for Texaco at 15, and started spending summers with the Forest Service at 18, falling from airplanes. With stints as teacher and opera chorister, he most recently and lengthily worked as a software engineer. He's been a real gift to our community, turning up at most literary events and pitching in whenever we needed help. He's going to be reading two poems from his manuscript, Hot Shots. Hot Shots defined by the Forest Service as the most elite wildland firefighters in the country. This is a manuscript full of rich narrative explorations of character, like those in The Monty Hall Problem and Tip Drop, two poems he'll share with you tonight. Please welcome Rim. Hi, everyone. This is going to be fun. Sandra, thanks for making this possible. I really appreciate everything you've done for us. For me, in the past three years uh, in the MFA program, um, I do appreciate it. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the other faculty members that have helped me so much. Quentin Bailey, Megan Marshall-Joseph, Ilya Kaminsky, Katie Ferris, Hal Jaffe, Joseph Thomas, Blas Falconer, Corinne Goria, Mary Garcia, of course, uh, Moshe Zonder, Shuki Ben Naim. Uh, everyone has been wonderful, and I've had a great three years. I also want to thank my sons, Leif and Aaron, and of course, uh, my wonderful Erica. I'm going to read uh, two poems today. The first is The Monty Hall Problem. I am a poet, plain and simple. Though mathematics was my first love, and Miss Stevens' high school geometry did nothing to alter my affection, but science was paired with Latin, and I soon became divided like Gaul. Apollo pulled me in one direction, differential calculus another, and though Mr. Layton would not say if light were a particle or a wave, I had to make a choice. Once Hernandez introduced me to Marvel's coy mistress, it became a foot race, scientific Americans slowly losing ground to Billy Collins. The trouble with poetry was always that it paid so little. I wanted children with their mouths to feed and smiles. Someone suggested I labor not in love, but computer science. That provided a home and kept the demons at bay until it didn't. I finally failed, had to leave. But who can win at every game? 
Which brings us to statistics, the law of large numbers. How certain is it that we say so little using so many formulae? Nor does intuition always lead to a prize. Let's make a deal. I'll switch from left brain to right while you align the stars in an assembly of English. Take my two million lines of code. See if you conjure up beauty. Not easy because we usually talk past each other, but a good poet can get it done in 14 lines. Much, much better odds than sticking with door number one. And this is Tip Drop. You were three years older than I and muscular and handsome, and my sister would sit in your lap and make out late at night after everyone else had left the campfire. You were the best skier on the lake with your signature tip drop. You would cut, take a huge jump off the wake, and at the apex, softly dip your ski before carving down the opposite side, head bent low and shoulders rounded, shoulders almost three times as wide as your waist. God, you were beautiful, and I was afraid of you. It was probably the beer, the camels, and your motorcycle, loud and heavy. But you never hurt me, not them. You had wheels, a marina blue 66 Chevelle, while the rest of us craved even a license. And when you came to pick up my sister, I would open our door, but say nothing. You lifted weights in a white sleeveless t-shirt, and we would just stare at your biceps and lats, smooth bulges rippling one to another, and tan from days on end chopping wood. You volunteered for Vietnam, had wives and children, but you shouldn't have. The alcohol loved you and you loved it, until finally when the explosion tore your already broken body, what remained was only me watching you stand at the end of the dock in your ski with a loop of rope in your hand. At the right moment, you yell, hit it and drop the loop. And as the rope becomes taut, you step off the dock and sink slightly into the water before planing onto the smooth surface of the lake. Thanks everyone, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, lots of love to everyone, be well. Hey Rin, good to hear your work. Um, the next reader will be a member of our fiction program, uh, Stacy Johnson. Uh, again, I've been reading Stacy's work for quite a while. Uh, greatly admire her impeccably crafted lyrical prose. Um, reading Stacy has the same kind of um, richness as reading uh, the best poetry. Um, Stacy's project for her third year here has been a novel called The Year of Strange Weather. And um, like many of the other uh, MFA students in their third year, she produced this whole novel from scratch. Although she'd been working on um, related short stories uh, for several years before this. So it didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, anyway, The Year of Strange Weather could be described as a PTSD novel. Uh, uh, a man who's a veteran of, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the two Iraq interventions. Um, and he's suffering from PTSD. He's constantly preparing for the end of the world. Um, and a big part of the novel deals with uh, his wife and his daughter trying to cope with uh, this man's insistence on obsessively hoarding and collecting things and taking walks where he explores uh, the various possibilities of the end of the world. Um, what's brilliant about the year of strange weather though is the prose itself. Uh, this is a real, just a real feast of brilliantly used language. Similes, metaphors, uh, incredible setting descriptions, especially in the um, high desert regions around the Salton Sea. Um, if that region, which we all know is extremely bizarre and post-apocalyptic, that region ever had needed a poet, Stacy Johnson is that poet. So Stacy's going to read uh, tonight from a section of the Year of Strange Weather. And Stacy, it's all yours. Thank you, Professor Martin, for this introduction. I'm Stacy Johnson, and I'm going to be reading to you an excerpt from my novel, 
the year of strange weather. This section is from the opening. Start with the fires. Consider this moment a few months before the first ember caught. On a night in late July, find a family, man, woman, child. The man drives. He pulls the overheating sedan into a lot adjacent to a campground near base. He pours coolant into the radiator and the trio steps into the open expanse of a picnic area north of the lot and 30 miles south of the nuclear station. They walk silently along the bowed edges of the land above the ocean toward a jetty. They walk as if in deference to the spontaneous exploration of an earlier time when the man and the woman were younger and the places they had yet to visit were the places they would explore together one by one. They would go when the time was right and when a certain mood in the man would make him say with a glinting eye, let's go. Although this is a time that is impossible for the child to have ever known or remembered, she wraps her body around the climate of the moment, as children do. She's still too young to know how the hours inside days might be curved within a series of patterns which form the railings that a flailing hand might grab in the moment when the cliff's edge gives out. She's still too young to properly imagine how the edges of solid-seeming things sometimes collapse. For the child, time undulates in an endless and unpredictable swelling and constriction of moments, each total and distinct from the next, the astonishment of and dread of each entire. In her awe, she tries to fathom how adults have ever learned to contain it behind calm faces and ordered arrangement of limbs. There, below the stars, far enough from the cliff's edge to move freely, but close enough to feel its pull and the pull of the ocean below, this family stands, each member suddenly small. They look and wait. The moon above them waxes gibbous, and here comes the first glow of Orion, and all of the almost visible stars continue to emerge. They are faint dusts of light at first, fine flower against plush black, printed by hands that were somehow splayed wide, as if to catch the first fall of rain after a long drought, before they close to contain what can be cupped to a mouth. Now, with head thrown back and mouth ajar, she spins beneath it, dizzy and fast, as if to rewind the gears marking the procession of moments toward her maturation. She spins against expectations of knowing and holding and standing still. Spinning, her gyres accelerate, rushing blood to her temples until she can't keep it in. The high-pitched eruption of her sing-song chant Sounds like the imitation of a Broadway performance. She's never seen a play, but the swelling sense of theatrical portent inspires the tiny voice behind her breastbone to erupt. Her voice sings shouts, melodic progressions of a single line. It's time, it's time, it's time. She's answered by the next crash of waves, and she cannot hear what her parents are saying because their voices are swallowed by the sea. Fifteen miles northeast of the picnic tables, in the bedroom of a single wide, on one of the overgrown lots adjacent to the base, a father keeps familiar watch. His eyes, long trained by now, focus beyond the wobbling blades of a ceiling fan on high against midsummer sweat. Between their winding edges, he sees his son, bearded now, descending through the hills. Down, down, left, right. The limping rhythm of his walk keeps time with a beat that reverberates against filaments of exploded memory. A cultivated softness to his tread whispers some awareness of the consequence of each step. Who is drumming, the father wonders. And also, 
what hands are left to hold and what feet to cross the mantle of the home long forsaken and in this space of silence this what voices still dare against the plasticine expanses of human conquest to ululate in dens oh, it's the coyotes to the east again perhaps in celebration of another murdered house pet there's a moment of pause at this din, a move to rise from the pillow to check. No, the cat is in, resting in the moonlight on the windowsill, shrouded by a screen. No answers come, and if this whisper has a purpose, he thinks he must be too dumb to name it. He warbles anyway, hushed rasp intoning, come. He imagines the syllable carried with portent through the salt air and the faint smell of ash against the sharper scent of eucalyptus. Come down, he urges, and here is several hundred miles southwest of the last free place, which was the last known address of his only descendant, the pilgrim on foot keeping watch in the badlands beyond the doomed cities. Come, he whispers, the net now pulling against the western perimeter of the desert and over the sloping meadows, beyond its unrelenting expanse toward the retreating lake, beside which the father once cut the first fish caught on his son's line, while the son behind him and beside him was fighting back tears. Still beneath the fan, he climbs now above the lake, through copses of oak and big cone pines, past the snow line and in view of the ocean and down again, past the avocado groves, taking care on the shoulder of SR-79 not to be bowled over by Harleys careening past SUVs too impatient to wait behind wide load 18 wheelers and the pickups of the ranch hands and vineyard keepers. Perhaps he will pause for a moment in the air-conditioned shade of a reservation casino to remember that few bets on a craps table are as safe as the six and the eight, no matter the minimum. And there he might stand to catch his breath, there he might wait, quenching thirst while ice cools his parched throat for the winds to balance the losses before moving west again into sunset until he runs out of land. Come, come come. In half time against the oscillation of the dusty blades above the father, relentlessly spinning against the unrelenting heat, like the cadence of a distant hammer thrown against the forged metal artifact of an extinct tribe. Now, when he no longer whispers, he listens. The meter he hears now is the softer still padding of tiny feet ghosting down a hallway where a sun still waits in frozen silence to be held. Then there's another blast and reports on CBS Nightly and again on ABC News of the troops returning home. And then there was a body in the living room but somehow no longer the spirit of the father who left in it. The padding had shushed to a whisper and after some time, after the sun grew, preparing to leave and then gone. There was nothing but space, keeping time against heartbeats. But which was it, the father wondered still, in intervals of silence. The man or the child he missed? Thank you. Hey, Stacy! great reading. Um, our next reader for tonight will be William Lambert, a fiction writer. I've been reading William's work for the past three years and admiring his willingness to explore various fictive possibilities. He's pretty much tried everything, horror, realism, uh, a kind of mixed genre work involving essayistic uh, elements combined with narrative elements. Uh, developed a strong interest in dialogue over the past year, and that dialogue has been a sustaining element in the project William's been working on this year, uh, a book called Black Coatl, which is a novel which explores 
the ambiguities of vigilante justice in an urban setting. Uh, this character, Black Quaddle, is a little bit like Spider-Man, um, although maybe a, a kind of parody of Spider-Man. Uh, Black Quaddle is a very disturbed, confused character. Um, he's a hero in many ways, uh, saving people, um, but he also uh, has a anger issues, <laughs> violence issues, and, and so we're not sure how much to like him. Uh, and I think that kind of ambiguity is perfect for a, a superhero uh, in the 21st century. Um, but tonight, William is not going to read from Black Quaddle. He's going to read from a short story, or not read from, he's going to read the whole short story called Decayed Martyr. Um, Decayed Martyr won this year's President's Award for the Arts at the Student Research Symposium. Uh, so William, congratulations on that. Uh, we're thrilled to hear that you won that, and we're eager to hear the story you're going to read for us tonight. William, take it away. Hello, everyone. Before I begin, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Martin uh, for the introduction. So the title of my story is called Worship of a Decay Martyr. I will begin now. <clears throat> he called himself the Messiah, walked among the unfortunate, proclaimed that God's kingdom was inclusive, cleansed the temple, challenged Rome, and paid for it, asking God why he'd forsaken him. His followers lost hope and disperse. Seven days since his death. Beneath the dark cloud sky, vultures circled above Gargotha, where three naked bodies stood crucified. One vulture swooped towards a bloated corpse, engulfed with whiplashes and perched on its shoulder, eyeing the swarming flies, picking around, picking around the thorns pricked to its forehead, smelling dried shit and decaying flesh. The vulture tore off its eye and ate it, ignoring the screams from below. A mother and her companions, Mary, a childhood friend of her son, and the disciple Simon stood paralyzed, watching the centurion beat Joseph of Arimathea. By yours of Pontanius Pilate, a, bur a burial won't be permitted. He forced Joseph up and kicked him from behind. Simon watched Joseph flee. Joseph was wealthy and had a tomb prepared. Simon had brought him, hoping he could bribe the centurion. Their last hope was gone, like their beloved leader, and it was his fault. Simon had promised to protect them. He fled. It should have been him on the cross. The mother rushed towards the centurion. Give me back my son! She banged her fist against his chest. He backhanded her. Know your place, Jew! The mother collapsed, sobbing. She'd given birth to the Messiah held him and watched him grow. She wanted to embrace him one last time before burial, but the centurion said he deserved to rot, claiming he was a threat to the state. Mary helped her up. She glanced up, bursting into tears. Remembering his warm embrace, he'd kiss her, never treat her like a whore. His loving face, once fearless, was marked with despair. Lifeless eyes, tortured with disappointment. Mouth gaped open, flashing rotten gums and teeth, screaming as if he was still crying to God. Simon put his hand on Mary's shoulder, insisting on walking the mother home. Before leaving, Simon looked up. His master was supposed to liberate the Jewish people, begin an age of peace and prosperity. What was he supposed to do now? Within three days, the mother hung herself. Mary was stabbed by a drunk client for laughing at a small penis. Each day, rows of crosses increased. The sun became another body among bodies, molding until bones lingered. The remains were tossed to the dogs. During this time, Simon and the disciples studied the scriptures for answers. They found a passage about a misunderstood servant who died for everyone's sins. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our inequalities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Isaiah 53, 4, 5. With the help of their, mas with the help of their master's half-brother James, they preached about the Messiah's death being part of God's plan 
so he could be resurrected. People asked him how he returned if his body rotted. They quote the scriptures and claimed that God had given him a new body as a reward for his loyalty. People believed them, although it created tension with those who believed that the Messiah was supposed to be a warrior, not a carpenter. The story attracted enough followers. The faithless, the faithless, became, the faithless became faithful again. Hope returned. It was the greatest lie ever told. News spread too quickly. Parts of the story were misinterpreted. People forgot that his body remained on the cross, believing he was buried before revival. The supposed tomb would become known as the Church of Holy Sepulchre, a major tourist attraction in Jerusalem. Even Gentiles wanted to convert. However, there is one problem. Converting to Judaism was required, a nightmare for the men because of circumcision. Then Paul the Apostle stepped in. Unlike the disciples, Paul was rich and Roman, allowing him more privilege. He told Gentiles that they did not have to be Jewish to become Christians, a relief for the men. Through his letters, marking the beginning of the New Testament, he wrote about preparing for the Messiah's return and the coming of the kingdom. Eventually, Christianity became the official religion of Rome, thanks to Emperor Constantine. The Messiah's crucifixion manifested into bodies of churches, expanding throughout several countries. But what was meant to help the Jewish people added to their suffering. In order to maintain peace with the Roman Empire, the Gospels portrayed Pilate as a sincere individual forced into enacting punishment. Unlike the real pilot who was devoid of empathy when he ordered the Messiah's crucifixion, the Romans were the true killers. However, the Jewish people were blamed even though the Messiah himself was Jewish. Anti-Semitism became part of the Christian doctrine, leading to years of persecution. Other misfortunes include wars, clashing Christian dominations, witch burnings, colonialism, the Spanish Inquisition, the elevation of discrimination towards queer people, justifications for American slavery, the founding of the Ku Klux Klan, contributions to systematic racism, gender equality, greed, scandalous activities, relative tactics, corporate corruption, class disparity, abuse of political power, and other tragedies too high to count. And while not directly responsible, the anti-Semitic attitudes that are common among Christians include tyrants like Adolf Hitler, to advocate for the genocide of millions during the Holocaust. The Messiah's intentions were noble. He wanted to help people, teach them how to live better lives. He died with it on the cross, never allowed the burial, but he was resurrected through word of mouth, texts, paintings, sculptures, and theater. His body, originally symbolizing despair, Convert to a symbol of hope and salvation, but the marginalized see his body as a reminder of past and continuing hoarders. Perhaps the Messiah is bare off dead, never knowing when his crucified body created. Thank you for watching and uh, have a great day. Our next reader for tonight will be Diana Fan. Diana is from the fiction side of the program and uh, a writer I've been admiring for the whole three years she's been here. Uh, Dan is one of the funniest writers in the program and one of the most unusual. Um, her new novel, Snake Wine, which she's been working on throughout the third year here, um, did not start from scratch. Diana was working on the characters in Snake Wine the whole time she was here, doing various stories involving these characters before finally set, uh, coming up with the, the, the narrative she's, she's got now and which she's been pursuing diligently. I admire Diana's uh, discipline uh, as much as I admire anything about her work. Um, Snake Wine is, I think, three or four hundred pages now, and we're not done. Uh, this is going to be a big novel. Um, you could maybe describe Diana's work as a combination of Pink Flamingos and Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. 
I mean, there's, there's nothing like Diana Fan's writing. Um, hilarious humor. Uh, uh, bizarre characters who are caught up in all sorts of sexual transformations. M2F, F2M, you name it. They'll show up in Diana Fan's snake wine. Um, I should say also that Diana's book, as it develops, involves some very complex, deeply developed characters. Uh, at first I thought Diana was mainly just funny, but I see now that there's a much more complex formula unfolding in her work. So Diana's going to read a segment of Snake Wine for us tonight. Diana, take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin, for that introduction. Before I begin my reading, I would like to thank those who have helped me out in this program. I would like to thank Dr. Martea Weber, Dr. Sharon Sexton, and Dr. Carol Ketchum for their support of my journey, along with T.J. Reynolds, Trump Cooligan, William Lambert, and my family and friends for working with me as well. This is an excerpt from my novel, Snake Wine. This novel focuses on a gay Vietnamese American teenage trans man named Jin, and he has been recruited by the SWA, an imaginary intelligence organization to confront a rogue population of human experiments called the Super Soldier. In the excerpt I'll be sharing with you tonight, Jin and his SWA mentor Cosmo, a sex-obsessed middle-aged general, are meeting with Jin's Uncle Ben, who is naming Jin to be the head of his family and giving him the ancestral Mai Bo sword. The Mai Bo were a clan of Buddhist warriors in ancient Vietnam. And now, let's begin the story. I understand your fears, Jin, Jin sighed. I heard every story out there about Asian families banning their child for being gay or transgender. But did you ever ask me what I thought about you? Bun told me that you wouldn't accept me. Nobody would accept me. And she's always right about everything. Hell, when I told you, you were all mad. It wasn't until Bun threatened all you that you were willing to accept me. And it's a moment I regret, Ben said. I wanted to conquer my fear and tell you that I accepted you. To tell you that I loved you no matter what. I could accept that my niece was my nephew. Why couldn't you? I was scared. My teeth and mouth moved, but there was no sound inside. Bun never cared about you. She saw you as a sword and shield. You attack and defend her when she commands you to, but I saw you as a human being. I didn't know what you were going to be, but I prayed to Buddha that you would grow up to be a good person. It was all I asked of Buddha. He looked up to the sky, above the banana trees and bamboo. Ben closed his eyes and listened to the breeze that whispered. He knew that the world was going to change and learn. And to keep the Maibos alive, he needed someone to be like the world. Ben got up from the lawn chair and went towards the shed. Come on, Jin. I got something to show you. It's our family history. Ben walked in the shed first and Jin followed. They also went in out of curiosity. Inside of the shed was all the Maibo family stuff. There were painted portraits and, fo and photos of the recent heads of the Maibos on the wall. On the shelves and glass cases, there were weapons that ranged from swords to guns and trophies. There were photos of Jin's grandfather when he stood with the American soldiers. It made him smile that his grandfather was the shortest, with his head only reaching up to their, their soldiers. When, Jin, when Ben saw his guitar, his hand twitched and he reached for it. Memories of soldiers giving him coins and glass bottles of coke appeared along with images of his father's death. He closed his eyes and saw the Vietnam dirt road, his skinny legs carrying him and his huge guitar that was reared on him. He heard the American soldiers ask him, Hey, little buddy, you got a song for us? Slowly, he picked up the guitar while Jin silently watched. Ben put it against him and smiled that the guitar finally fit his middle-aged chubby frame. He brushed the strings and an off-tuned sound emerged with the dust cloud. He quickly stopped and tuned his guitar carefully. Ben stopped and kept walking until he stopped at his father's trunk. It was a large and green trunk with a rope tied around it. What is it, Jin? This is my father's trunk. We never opened it, ever since he died. We all thought that this is where he kept his treasures. I think it's best if he respected his wishes, Ben said. He walked over to the large photo of his father and his family standing in front of their house in Vietnam. It looked like it was filtered with a blurry cloud. Ben gently removed the photo and pulled out a large rectangular cake. He gestured for Jim to follow him to one of the tables and he placed it down. Ben turned to the case to reveal the swords to Jin. In front of Jin were the Maibo butterfly swords, which were 12 inches long with engravings on the blades with bronze and gold handles. On the right sword, there was a four-legged Chinese dragon and around it was Tu Nam writing. 
and, the, and a phoenix on the left sword that had the same writing. Holy crap, Jin eyed the sword. He could swear he saw the dragon and phoenix images emerging from the dust when they saw him. Did anyone tell you about the mist surrounding these swords? Ben said. No, I just know that we had two swords that were passed down over the generations to the heads of the family. Ben smiled. Well, some people believe that the swords are magic. I may not know what the Junom ranks is, but I can't believe in the magic. People would say that when Buddha blessed us with fighting skills, he gave us a wing from a dragon and a wing from a phoenix to give these swords the power to fight monsters. He picked up the swords and placed them together and make one. When they're together, they delivered the judgment of heaven. Then he separated the swords. Separate, they moved their own ways. He swept the right sword with, with the dragon and Jin heard the air get sliced with a loud whoosh. The dragon delivers the rain. It tells the people you're defending and helping them. Then with the phoenix sword, Ben moved gracefully. The phoenix delivers peace. Dragon and phoenix are husband and wife, man and woman. They must, and they must be together. They say that these swords will always return to the heads of the Maibo family. He placed the swords down into the case and moved them towards Jin. Wait, I don't think I deserve these swords. Are you sure you're not making a hasty mistake? The Maibo leadership changes. Before strength was valued, then other attributes were added. Just like how the family changes. There's no such thing as a pure Maibo. Down the line, we blend we blended with the other martial arts families. Look at yourself, Jim. You're a my Vo and a Kim Lee. Ben glanced at the sword. I think, since I was the last one to see my father die, and this was my plan, I should be the one that grants you the sword. What if I mess up? Remember what you told us about the incident you caused that brawl in Vegas? The one that caused this whole chain of events. What did you tell us? That I messed up and I was going to do something about it. And that, and that was a really bad idea. Ben nodded and thought, you're on your way to be, to be an excellent head of the family. At least you took responsibility for your actions and learned something. That's what makes a great leader. They learn, change, and care for the people. I think you're going to be a fine teacher, especially in this world. The world always learns, and we must. But I'm too young to be the head. This is a weird world, Jim. And the whole family is nearing their 60s. We're too old. I think we need to have some young blood lead us. Jim put his hands on the one table and looked in Ben's eyes, where he saw that his uncle had confidence in him as his new head of the mind post. But Jim needed a second opinion, one that was critical. Someone who had been in the same position as him. He turned to Cosmo, who was slowly untying the ropes on his grandfather's trunk. What are you doing, Jim said. Quiet. I'm trying to figure out what your grandpa's secret was. Only family can find out what's in that trunk. Technically, Castle ends family, Ben said. He's kind of like, he's kind of, he's your mentor, and I kind of see him as your second father. He gives you advice and cares for you. Hell, he knew how to discipline you after that brawl. You know how hard it always been to control you? Really, Jen said? I would be more than happy to call him my brother. To me, he's an honorary my vote. You just like him because he likes the same music as you. Kelsa kept on her. You better start calling me Daddy Jin. Screw you, old man! Jin said. Kelsa chuckled. <laughs> By the way, the whole sword and family thing. Word of advice from someone who became a general in his early 30s. Be thankful they're making you the head position because they think you can do it. Not out of desperation and spite. Me? Kelsa was pointing out as a pure spite. Um, Ben? Jen said? Yes. Can I still run to you if I don't know something? Ben smiled. I'm always happy to help Jen. Jen touched the Maibo swords and felt the cold bronze handle. He ran his thumbs against the gold guard and saw his reflection on the blade. He could have sworn he saw the dragon and phoenix happy when they saw him. They seemed to dance. I heard my father say once that when the dragon and phoenix are happy, you know you're in good hands. That's how all the Maivos know that that is the true head of the family. Jin smiled. Ben lifted the velvet material of the case, revealing the sword holsters. He gave them to Jin, who put them around his waist. The butterfly swords formed wings on both sides of Jin and glowed in the light. This is just cool, Jin said. I wonder if Grandpa will be happy if I'm the new head. I'm sure he'll be proud of you. Just like how I'm proud of the man you've grown up to be. 
Grandpa was a hero, Jim. And I know you'll be too. Kyoto opened the trunk and his face lit up like he won the lottery. Oh, your grandpa was a hero, all right. Kyoto turned to Jin and Ben and smiled. Ben saw his father's trunk open and the ropes on the girl untied. And he's a man of culture! What? Kyoto reached into the trunk and pulled out two stacks of Playboy magazines from the 60s and 70s. Ben and Jin looked stunned, gaping their mouths when Kyoto showed, them, showed him the magazines. Ben understood why his father got so defensive when the kids and his wife got near his trunk. Ben assumed that the American soldiers gave it to his father. You didn't tell me that Grandpa was a pervert! Jin yelled at Ben. I swear to God, I didn't know. I just know that he yelled at us not to open it. Jin put his hands on the set. Oh, Jesus. Jin, don't tell anybody you saw this. Let's all remember, Grandpa was a hero and he sacrificed his life for us. He made a great sacrifice, all right, Kelsey said. I, too, would sacrifice my life for Playboy. He opened one of the magazines and smiled at the naked centerfold as it unraveled, as it unraveled like a pornographic origami. I think to save Grandpa's reputation, we should burn him. Jin said, Kelsey clutched onto the Playboy sack for dear life. You burn him, I will kill you. It's just a bunch of magazines with naked ladies. It's more than that. It's art. Bullshit. Jin, Jin turned to Ben. You see the kind of crap I have to deal with? He's always buying or finding smut. I'm a romantic, Jin. Kelsey turned towards Ben. Hold on, I got an idea. You give me all his Playboys and your father will be clean. Ben replied, no, I don't think my father will like this. I should respect his wishes. $1,000. No! Smart man driving a hard bargain. Two thousand. No! Five thousand. Cash. Deal. Gal Ben, what's wrong with you? Jin yelled. Jin, I have bills to pay. Eris is my store burned down. I need an ass egg. Besides, they'll be best for Grandpa if we do this. You, sir? Castle pulled out a wad of cash from his pocket and hands to Ben. Are a hero in my eyes. He shook his hand, then he grabbed the stack of Playboys and went. What's Grandpa going to think when he finds out that you sold his Playboys for $5,000, Jin said. Ben looked up and imagined his father in heaven. I'm sure he'll understand. If not, we can run to Buddha. He can't kill us in front of Buddha. Thank you very much. Hey, Diana, thanks for a really great reading. Uh, great to hear your work. Great to hear everyone's work tonight. This has been a really moving experience for me. A rite of passage in the best sense of the word. A way of honoring the steps you've all taken in the mastery of a creative art form. It's been a privilege for me to have shared that with you. The question now is, of course, what comes next? Rite of passage means that something is ending Something new is beginning. Well, as you look at the literary world today, most of you, I'm sure, feel kind of overwhelmed. There's so much great work being done out there, that's for sure. And you could ask yourself, what place is there for me in all this? Well, I think we have to assume, when we're moving forward, that the best books have yet to be written. And we wouldn't be graduating you if we didn't have the confidence that you could write those books. In fact, I expect you to write those books. And I know you won't let me down. Thanks to all of you for joining us here tonight. It's a difficult world that we're living in. I don't have to tell any of you that. The past four years have been a political abomination. And then at the end of that, the coronavirus. And we're forced to do our graduation reading online. But ultimately, we'll prevail. Our works will outlast the, the present political administration and the coronavirus. So while it's important to live safely, it's also important to live creatively. Thanks again for joining us.